Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come and, and hang out in your house together. Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to us today um, as we wrap up uh, this series on, on the Bible, Lord. Um, I just pray that, um, that your wisdom flows through this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 to start stuff off. We're going to read uh, starting in verse 14. If you do have a Bible or, or a smartphone and you want to whip it out, go for it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to show the, uh, the verse up on the screen here. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become uh, convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And now from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul writes to this, this young kid, Timothy, uh, about from, how in, from infancy he knew the Holy Scriptures. Meaning from, from he's just a young little lad, Timothy was biblically literate. Okay, now we fast forward 2,000 years later. Here we are in, in Irvine in, in 2023. And even though a lot of, this, of us grew up in the church, a lot of us don't really know our Bible that well anymore. Right? It's been something that's just kind of been lost. We don't participate in it as, as a practice like was done in the ancient world. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, the Bible, as we talked about last week, um, is a library of writings that are both divine and human and that together tell a unified story which leads the reader to Jesus. We looked at that two weeks ago. And then last week, we looked at where did the Bible come from? And I got to be a, a big nerd with my laser pointer and the pictures, and it was super fun for me. <laughs> this week, we're, we're looking at the question, what is the Bible for? Meaning, what role does it play in the kingdom of God? Or put it another way, when you pick up your Bible and you open it and you jump in, what exactly is it supposed to do for, for you or for me, or, or community, or, or city as a whole? And behind that, of course, the, the deeper question, is it really important? Does it actually matter? So that's what we're going to tackle today. In, in Timothy here, I see uh, three reasons for the Bible. So what is the Bible for? Well, three th thoughts, and if you're taking notes, the first one is uh, to know who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. The opening line of the Bible is in the beginning who? God, right? The Bible is first and foremost about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about how to get ahead in life or, or have a great marriage or start a, a killer business or even how to get to heaven when you die. A lot of that stuff is in there. But the Bible is a story. The protagonist is not Abraham or Moses or me or you. It's God. It's God himself. He's the center of this library. In fact, you can think of the Bible as God's kind of self-disclosure statement. The word used in theology is, is divine revelation. Divine revelation means that it's God himself saying, this is who I am. And this is who I'm not. And we need to know this more now than ever because there's just so much bad thinking about who God is. Eugene Peterson says it like this. God and his ways are not what most of us think. Most of us, what we're told about God and his ways by our friends on the street or read about in the papers or view on television or think up on our own is simply wrong. Maybe not dead wrong, but wrong enough to mess up the way we live. And this book, the Bible, is precisely a revelation, a revealing of what we could never figure out on our own. I love that. What we could never figure out on our own. And this is why it matters. Tozer, A.W. Tozer says, we tend by secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. What he meant by that was we tend to become like who we think God is. The ISIS terrorist cutting off the head of the infidel. 
the prosperity gospel celebrity preacher getting out of his Hummer after late night drinks with Kanye West. The Westboro Baptist picketer at the military funeral screaming, God hates. The gay singer at the Grammys thanking God for his hit single about a one night stand. The Catholic nun who, who gave up her life and marriage and success to live in the slums of India and work with the destitute and the dying. The husband who's faithful to his wife throughout chronic illness, decade after decade until death do us part. The business tycoon who, who rather than getting sucked into materialism um, is, is known for giving away 90% of his or, or her income to the kingdom. Each one of these men and each one of these women do what they do because of what they believe about God. So clearly what we believe about God matters. It's not just this abstract idea. And this is why the Bible is essential. There's just so much bad thinking about who God is. Not only out there on the street, but, but here in the church and in our own minds and our own imaginations. There's just a lot of bad thinking about God. And so the Bible helps us sort through all those misconceptions and get at who God actually is. And in particular, the parts of the Bible about Jesus, because this is a library about God. But that said, it's also about us. So the opening line of the Bible is in the beginning, God. And then just a, a paragraph or two later, we, we read that God created human beings in his own image, in his own likeness. So when we discover who God is, we discover who we are. Our culture wants to label you with an identity. You're gay, you're straight, you're transgender, you're Republican, you're, you're Democrat, you're a hipster, you're, you're a hippie, you're a jock, you're urban, you're suburban, you're blue collar, you're, you're intellectual, you're creative, you're cool, you're uncool, you're, you're whatever. The Bible is God's way of saying, no, this is who you are. You are made in the image and the likeness of God. As a human being, whether you follow Jesus or not, you have value and worth and beauty. But if you read the story, you're also broken. You're bent out of shape, you're corrupt, and you're guilty of sin. But still you are loved by the God who made everything. Deeply loved. That's who you are. So the Bible is about who God is, and it's about who we are. And then it's about how we relate to others. Each of the, or most of the Bible is stories. And most of the stories about human beings interacting with God. And here's what happens. A lot of the time we, we miss the point of the stories because they don't always have a, a moral lesson. Sometimes they do for sure. But a lot of the time there is no moral lesson. This week I, I, re I read through Genesis and, and there's a lot of sex in Genesis. And a lot of it is kind of messed up and weird. Like you read it, it's not G-rated, right? If this was a movie, my kids would not be watching it. And I wouldn't watch it, right? But even the best characters in the Bible, they're just very human. But these stories aren't necessarily telling us how to live. Often they're telling us how not to live. Case in point, all the stories about polygamy. There's a lot of polygamy in the Bible, in the Old Testament at least. Uh, but every single example is negative. Right? In Genesis, that, that doesn't change as you read through it. In fact, it gets worse. Everyone is a dysfunctional mess. There's anger and jealousy and infighting and, and favoritism and, and sibling rivalry, right? It, it's soap opera nasty, right? Like reading Genesis at times is like watching bad daytime TV. It's like, what? That's his daughter-in-law. Gross. Stop it, right? <laughs> if anything, the Bible is, is God's indictment of polygamy. But here's the beauty of the story of God, right? Like we know this, God, God works through the polygamy. 
So think of Israel, God's chosen people. The 12 tribes come from 12 sons who come from four mothers and one dad, Jacob, right? Four moms, one dad. And that is not a sign of God's blessing on polygamy, right? If we read the story, Joseph and the the technicolor dream coat, the brothers at each other's throats, it's a disaster. The sign of God's blessing is in spite of all the polygamy and stuff, God's mercy on Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and so on and so forth. My point is, these stories aren't necessarily telling you how to live or even how not to live, but rather how ordinary, normal, at times incredible, at other times screwed up, most of the time a mixture of both, but, but people, men and women relate to God. I love this from Dallas Willard. The open secret of many Bible-believing churches is that only a very small percentage of their members study the Bible with even the degree of interest, intelligence, or joy that bring to bear upon their favorite newspaper or magazine. Right, so just like think, if you go on Instagram tonight and you count up all the posts about Taylor Swift and you compare those to all the posts about Leviticus, we know who's gonna win. And in my opinion, this is primarily because we don't know or or we're not taught how to understand the experience of the biblical characters in the terms of how they experience life. Meaning we read about Abraham in Genesis or Moses in Exodus and we think, oh, that that was great. That was about them then. That was great for Abraham. That was great for Moses. But it's not me. It's not who I am. It's not how I relate to God. And that's what's going on. The dream is, though, that as you read scriptures, that you would immerse your mind's eye and your imagination in the story. That you would become the character that you're reading about, good, bad, and ugly. And that you would learn how to, right in the chaos and the mess of your life, you learn how to relate to God. So the first reason for the Bible is to tell us who God is, who we are, and how to relate to each other. The second reason is, is to tell the real true story of human history. And if you want extra credit, there's no extra credit, but we're going to pretend. If you want it, write down through the lens of Israel. Like I said two weeks ago, most of the Bible is a story. Remember that that pie graph? And most of the Bible is literally narrative. Uh, But on top of that, Most of the library of scripture is a story. It's a sprawling, long, complex, drawn out over times, but sporadic story that is just one unified story. And it it tells the story of human history from the very beginning. That's what the word Genesis means, the beginning, right? All the way through to where we are today. Now it tells the story through the lens of Israel. It's not through the lens of China or Argentina. And it's not a textbook. I think of uh, the show, The Band of Brothers. It's a story about this one group of men inside of a much larger story, World War II, right? In the same way, this story about one nation inside inside of a much larger story of what God was up to in all the nations. God was up to all sorts of stuff all over the world. It's just not in here. But God was up to something special in Israel. Israel is what's called God's chosen people because it was out of Israel that God would draw out the Messiah who would bring the healing and the renewal of God's creation. That's what the story is about. And here's why this matters. Let's think about this for a minute or so. Like all of us live by a story, meaning all of us live by some kind of a narrative that makes sense of the questions of life. Who are we? Where did we come from? What's the meaning or the purpose of life? And there are all sorts of stories out there. Even in this kind of late modern, hyper-secular world, there are all sorts of stories. If you want to call it worldview, you could call it that. Even atheism, the the most anti-story there is, is still a story. Who are we? Evolved animals. Where do we come from? A glorious accident. What is the meaning and purpose of life? There is none. Life doesn't need a mini purpose. It's just what you make of it. 
Well, that's a story. It's a framework to make sense of the miracle that is life when you get out of bed in the morning. The Republican convention has a story. They have, they have a narrative about what's right and wrong, where the world is going. The left has a story to tell. Irvine has a story to tell. It, it's beautiful as long as you're driving through it, but it's loud if you walk through it because of all the machines that are going to make it beautiful to drive through. That's the story of Irvine. That's how people make sense of, the, of living in this place. There are all, all sorts of stories out here. And here's the point. The Bible is an alternative story. It's a story that subverts and it upends all the other stories out there. The South American philosopher Ivan Illich was once asked, after decades of turmoil and, and change in South America, what's the best way to change society? Is it violent revolution or gradual incremental reform over time? And his answer was telling, he said, neither. He said, if you want to change a society, you have to tell an alternative story. If you want to change a society, you have to tell an alternative story. Well, that's what the Bible does. It tells an alternative story, alternative to capitalism or socialism or Buddhism or Islam or secular, secularism or sexual tolerance. Whatever the story is, it exposes the weak points and all the other stories that we live by. Mike Geary has a great little book called Why the Bible Matters. And he writes this, the Bible reveals the world as it really is. It's not primarily a theological textbook, a body of laws and regulations, or a collection of nice moral stories. It is a story that presents a different way of seeing the world and our lives in it. Now, when I say story, I don't mean a, a fiction or figment of the imagination. I mean, it's a real true story of the world. Leslie Newbigin, who's this famous missionary to India, he has this great little book, and he writes about um, this Hindu intellectual friend that he met, and he has a conversation of the Bible. And the Hindu friend says this, I can't understand why you missionaries present the Bible to us in India as a book of religion. It's not a book of religion. And anyway, we have plenty of books on religion in India. We don't need any more. I find your Bible a unique interpretation of universal history. The history of the whole creation and the history of the human race. And therefore, a unique interpretation of the human person as a responsible actor in history. This is unique. There's nothing else in the whole religious literature of the world to put alongside it. And he's right. If you've read the Quran or the Book of Mormon or the Baba Gita, if you've ever read that stuff, you know that the Bible stands apart. There's nothing like in all of religious literature in the world. That's why reading the Bible is an, is an exercise of the imagination. What I mean is as, as you open your Bible in the morning or at night for one of those guys, wh whatever your routine is, as you start to read, you step into a whole new world. In particular, in, in particular, as you come out of this kind of postmodern secularism, you know, West, you step into this whole new world where, where God is not only real, but he's up close and he's involved and with authority and power and he steps in. He steps into a world where, where a virgin gives birth to the Messiah, where death is not the last word where evil is real and personified and at work in the world, but where one day we know that God will make it right. It's a whole, amen. It's a whole new world. One that, that you and I are just not used to, but it takes an exercise of the imagination. You rethink reality from the ground up. It's an exercise in, in participation. It's the kind of story that you have to join in and hopefully we carry forward. I just want to restate, most of the Bible does not tell you what to do. A lot of it does, particularly in the New Testament. A lot of it does tell you what to do and what not to do. And some it tells you what to think or what to feel or what to believe. But most of it just tells you stories. 
about a man and a woman who can't give birth, about another woman who can't stop giving birth, and how they don't like each other, or whatever the story is about. And here's the thing, a really good story does something to you where you want to join in. Call back to first week, Star Wars, anybody? Right, find me a 10-year-old boy who doesn't want to be a Jedi Knight. They don't exist. And if they do, shame on you, mom and dad. That's your fault. But imagine for a moment, what if the Star Wars universe was real? Which it is. But imagine that the, the Millennium Falcon is out there. If that was a real true story and you, and you read it, you'd want to live it. You'd want to step into that new reality. Well, the Bible is not made up. It's not make-believe. It's not a figment of somebody's imagination. It's not wishful thinking. It's a real true story of the world. And it calls you as a reader, in particular as a follower of Jesus, to step into the story, to participate in it every day. N.T. Wright, who's a, a, a New Testament theologian and scholar, and he has this little analogy um, that I kind of find really helpful. And he writes that we should think of the Bible as a five-act play. So, you know, get your, your inner thespian on for a minute. Uh, act one is creation. Act two is the fall. Act three is, is Israel, which is by far the big, big bulk of the Old Testament. And then act four, we have Jesus. And then act five is the church. And his analogy makes the point that we are the people of Jesus. So we live in act five. And we're like the actors in this play. But all we have is this opening scene of act five. The four gospels, the book of Acts. And then the closing scene, the book of Revelation. We know where we've come from. And we know where we're going, but we don't have the middle part. And so our job as actors in this play is to improvise. Like all of you, that, that secret, the whole world is really an improv play that you've been dreaming about is true, right? We're to step into the story as actors and based on where we know it comes from and where we know it's going to go, we are to act out the story, to carry it all forward. I love that. So reason number one is to tell you who God is, who we are, and how to relate to each other. Reason two is to tell you the real true story of human history. And then finally, and this is by far the most important one, to shape the people of God into the image of Jesus so that we can participate in the ongoing story of healing and renewal. I'm going to say it again, to shape the people of God into the image of Jesus so that we can participate in the ongoing story of healing and renewal. Like I said a minute ago, this is a story that calls its readers into participation. But to do that, to join in this story that we, that we read about the, the healing of the sick and prophecy and, and life and miracles and faith and justice and enemy love. To join this kind of a story, we have to become a very specific kind of person. We have to become, in particular, like Jesus. And that's the main thing I want to say today. When we open up your Bible in the morning tomorrow, do not read the Bible just for information, but for formation. Meaning we read the Bible to be formed, to be shaped, to be shaped into the image of Jesus. The scholar John B. Green had this to say. Reading the scriptures should be an exercise in our submission to God. We don't read simply for information, but also for formation. We read so the scriptures will shape us to be more and more like Christ. Spiritual formation is not measured by how much we know about the Bible or how often read the Bible, but by the, but by the way we follow Jesus. This is the bottom line. We can be familiar with much of the Bible 
and still not love or follow Jesus. How crazy is that? You can know the Bible. In fact, you can know the Bible really well and still be an, an arrogant, selfish, foolish jerk. Right? I, I'm shocked by the phenomena of the mean Christian. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, it's a contradiction in terms. Because most of the followers of Jesus I know, and, and no sales pitch here, but in all honesty, are the nicest people in the world. But there are some who claim to be followers of Jesus who are just really lame. And if you don't, I'm not looking at you. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just read any comments on, on Twitter from a, a public Christian figure who posts anything. Right? The, the rise of the phenomena of the mean Christian, it's bizarre, but it's happening. And that's why it's crazy to me how, how many of these mean Christians say they're Bible-believing Christians. That's usually in their like little tagline. And with all due respect, apparently Bible-believing does not mean the same thing as Bible-living. The Bible is not just designed to be believed, but to be lived. It's not enough to read it. It's not enough to study it. It's not enough to know it backwards and forward. It's definitely not enough to just believe it. You have to live it. Somewhere along the way, this library became a system of beliefs rather than a way of life. And those two things were never supposed to be separated or to be pulled apart. If we circle back to that Timothy 3, I think it's fascinating what Paul writes in 16. He says, all scripture is God-breathed, right? Remember that from two weeks ago? It's inspired and it's useful. I love that. It's useful. It's useful. And then there's this laundry list for, for teaching how to follow Jesus. For rebuking, like not how you follow Jesus. Correcting, training in righteousness. And the idea of righteousness, that was great. Now try this, good, that's better. And so that, and here's the end goal. Here's how that should happen. If you read the Bible and you read it well, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, it says. I love that. Thoroughly equipped. You become a very specific kind of person for every good work in order to join in what God is up to in this world. Scripture plays a role of sculpting, of shaping your thinking and your feelings and your believing. And out of that, you're living. I love this quote in particular from N.T. Wright. The Bible isn't simply a repository of true information about God, Jesus, and the hope of the world. It is rather part of the means by which in the power of the spirit, the living God rescues his people and his world and takes them forward on the journey towards his new creation and makes us agents of that new cre creation even as we travel. That's why that guy's famous, okay? How good is that? It is rather part of the means by which in the power of the spirit, God does his thing. Meaning God is at work through the scriptures to shape a new covenant community. Meaning a community of men and women and children who come together on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to shape all of us into the image of God so that we can participate in the story. We get out there and join in what God is up to in our city, in our house, in our street, in our world. And here's why that matters. Scripture isn't the only thing out there that shapes us. We are constantly being shaped 24-7. In particular, we're, we're being shaped by our habits and our community and our environment. Our habits, that, that show that we watch. If you have an addiction to some random TV show, and, and most of you do, I think for Jessica and I, it's the show alone, right? I think that I could survive alone 
longer than all those other people. And I might enjoy it. That TV show you watch, that the daily hour at the gym, that, that weekly place you eat for lunch, shopping online, whatever the habit is, do not underestimate the spiritual power that habit has to shape you. We are little more than just a cumulative effect of our daily habits. What we do on a regular basis, we become. So our habits shape us and then our community, the, the people that we live by in our apartment complex or on our street, the people we work with, our friends, our, our church or lack thereof, it all has a shaping influence on us. And then our environment, the city we live in, the culture we're part of. And in this day and age, wherever you're born, all this has a huge shaping influence on your character and on who you actually are. And it's from the ground up. And we're not passive. We're active in all of this. We want to think of ourselves, or at least I do, I want to think of myself as a brick wall. Like nothing's getting in here. But I'm a chain link fence. Right? Things are just blown in and I, I'm an influence and, and I'm influencing and, I, and I'm formed and I'm forming other people. And, and the scriptures are counterformation. They're counterformation, meaning they are one of the ways that we're consciously uh, choosing to be formed into the image of, of Jesus and not the world around us. Willard writes this, we come to the scriptures as part of our conscious strategy to cooperate with God for the full redemption of our life. Do you have a conscious strategy to cooperate with God for the full redemption of your life? Because the reality is that life has an inertia to it. You are becoming a type of per person with each passing second and minute and hour and day. And if you let that inertia of this world carry you, if it carries you forward 10 years from now, you'll be different than you are now, for better or worse. And you might not like who you become. The scriptures are a way to put the brakes on that and say, yeah, not that, not this world, as much as I love it, but Jesus that's who I want to be 10 years from now. I want to look and feel and dress and act and vote and spend money and speak and express my sexuality and be in community and do relationship like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus every single day. And one of the ways that we do that is through deliberate effort and to partner with Jesus to that end, every, every morning we wake up and we open our Bible and we read and we are shaped in the image of Jesus. My hope and my prayer for you is that if you haven't, you develop a daily habit of reading the scripture. And that you just sit in, in listening prayer before God. Bible open. Heart open mind open, open to the Holy Spirit. That's a win. But my dream is that you, they would not just read the Bible for the rest of your life. The dream is that you and I, that we as a community will be shaped into the image of Jesus. That a year from now, that 10 years from now, 20, 30, on my 80th birthday, that we as a community would look and feel more like Jesus than we ever did before. Now, obviously, to that end, there are a number of challenges that we face. And a bunch of you probably had two that came to your mind really fast. One is just the fact that, that we don't really read that much as a culture anymore. At least not books, right? I read a stat re recently that said, 78% of Americans never read a book all the way through. Oof, seriously. No wonder we're so messed up, right? Like that's crazy. Now some of you, I know some of you are readers. I am, I think it's fantastic. But as a, as a general rule in our culture at large, we, we really don't read anymore. 
or we read, and, and I mean like we read like a news app or a Twitter feed, which I just don't think really counts. <laughs> An Instagram post. I, I, I was scrolling through Instagram and, and someone was like, I love your writing. And I look, I'm like, it's three sentences. <laughs> that doesn't count. Social media posts, it doesn't count as a writing. But that's what we're used to. It's like, oh, you, you read a book. That's a lot of words. <laughs> so I might read an online article here or there. I pick up the paper while I'm waiting for my latte or whatever, the coffee shop. But we, as a culture, we're just not used to reading books anymore. And books move us at a, at a very different pace, right? So that's one challenge. But here's the even greater challenge. When we do read a book, usually read either for information or for entertainment. Information, we're taught a very young age, right? I have three kids in elementary school and they're being indoctrinated to read a book for information. You read this book, you study, you take the test, you get the grade. Or for entertainment. And if you like to read, and in particular if you're an, an introvert, it's better than going to a good movie, right? Because I don't have to deal with all those people there. <laughs> They're annoying me, right? Some of us love to read. I read over 60 books last year. I love to read, right? I read every single day. I'd rather read a book than most anything else. I love it. And some of that was for entertainment. It's not bad to read for entertainment. And it's not bad to read for information. I do it every single day. Uh, and so do a lot of you. But when we come to the Bible... We don't primarily read for information. Although there's a lot of information in here and a lot of stuff that God does want us to know, and we definitely don't read, at least not primarily, for entertainment either. The Psalms are, are poetic and haunting, and, and quite a few of the stories you just can't put down. They're entertaining. But a lot of it, if we're honest, it doesn't feel that fun. Right, you get through about like Exodus 34 and it's just not a lot of fun until like Deuteronomy. And you're thinking, that's like three books, Mark. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great stuff, right? Deuteronomy is amazing. Uh, it seemed like Jesus' favorite book of the Bible. Right? He quoted Deuteronomy more than anything else. I mean, it's fantastic. And you open it up and some of you will love it. But sometimes you'll read Exodus 33 or 34 and think, oh my gosh, it's amazing. But then other times you're reading and think, I have no idea what the heck's going on here. And that's okay. And that's, that's fine because it's not Harry Potter, okay? We're not reading this just for fun. We're reading it to meet with God, okay? The scriptures are a sacrament. They're, they're a moment of encounter between heaven and earth. When the life of heaven and the life of earth with all its problems and issues and, and pain and hope and joy and suffering, in that moment they overlap. Tomorrow morning, Bible open. Maybe a cup of coffee if you're very holy. Maybe not. <laughs> but heart and mind open to the Holy Spirit, saying, God, here I am. Have your way with me. Come speak over my life. And in that, in that moment of overlap between heaven and earth, you are shaped. You're shaped into a far more profound person in a way that the city could never do. So may you read your Bible this coming week. May you step into this real, true story of the world and how to relate and figure out how to, how to relate to God. And may it shape you and it may, it may shape me. It may shape us as a, a community and that will be shaped into the image of God, amen? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you chose such a profound way uh, to record human history, Lord. That your, your words are just spoken so clearly sometimes plainly and clearly for us. Um, but Lord, that you just spoke to us and that you chose to create a way for us to have community with you every day. 
Lord, I just pray that you will help us to be shaped by your word. That we'll choose that relationship with you. That we'll choose to take the opportunity to, to commune and be guided by you, Lord. And overall, that through your word, Lord, that we'll be shaped. That we'll become more and more like Jesus. That we'll choose to become just this, this alternate thing to this world. That we can stand out. People will say, what is different about Pacific Church? And that we can say it's because we're like Jesus. That we choose every day to get into our Bible and to learn and to grow. And that we prosper in that, Lord. That we became a unique community of Jesus followers here in Irvine. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray.